Hey everyone, I'm getting a lot of questions about the third lab, so I thought I would just quickly run through the concepts in case the way Professor Ray said it wasn't entirely clear. So it all really comes down to um, looking at the sort of patterns that you see on the screen like this. So he has given you a couple patterns that looks um, like an intensity pattern like this, where there are kind of bright spots and dark spots and bright spots and dark spots. And on top of this, there are kind of little intermediate ripples of bright and dark spots within these kind of larger regions. And again, what you're seeing is the diffraction pattern from a double slit experiment. And so he wrote down the expression that if you look at any one of these locations on some sort of observational plate as a function of time, you can calculate the average intensity that arrives at that one particular location on the sensor. And you can come up with an expression that might look something like this. Actually, looking at this, I think this should be, uh, no. Well, this is a square or something like that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But you get some expression that depends on two kind of weird looking trig functions. One is the result of what you get from just having a single slit that has some finite width A, which may be large or small compared to the wavelength of the light that's trying to get through where the observing sensor is some distance L away from the slit. And then we are looking at it as a function of the position along the slit. And I'll review what all these variables mean in a bit. On top of the single slit pattern, you're also seeing you know, all these little extra bumps and wiggles as a result of a diffraction pattern caused by the fact that there are, can be multiple slits. So if you have a double slit, for example, you get all these added features on top of the intensity. And that is given to you by this additional term, this kind of cosine squared term, which depends similarly on the wavelength of the light, the distance the sensor is away from the slits, the position you are along the sensor. But now instead of the size of the slits, it is a function of the distance separating the two slits. And so this is a general expression if you want to understand the intensity pattern, like what is shown above and what we'll look at below. For either a single slit, or if there's a double slit, you take your single slit result and you multiply it by this additional term, uh, this additional cosine squared term. So the goal of, is then to understand how to use this to find interesting information. So let's look at the single slit and remind us really briefly about the single slit. So again, the idea of a single slit is you have some wavelength of light that is, or you have some amount of light that has some wavelength lambda coming in, maybe as a plane parallel wave, and it's only allowed to pass through some slit that has some size A. And you've talked about that for um, a slit that is infinitesimally small, like a point, um, you, will get this, you will get this ripple as the wave moves out kind of radially away from that point from where it emerges out in all directions. Um, as a combination of crests, troughs, crests, troughs, etc. And then eventually as it travels along, it will eventually make it to some sensor. And then from the sensor where we define zero or x equals zero as the line just symmetric along where the slit is located as a function of the distance away from that center point, which we call x, we can measure the intensity of the radiation that arrives at that point. Now for waves, 
if I just think of an individual wave that oscillates up and down. Obviously, as a function of time, sometimes I will be giving a, I'll be, a crest will be hitting that point on the sensor, sometimes a trough will be hitting that point on the sensor, sometimes nothing will be hitting at the sensor. But what we're looking at here is what the average intensity is as a function of time. And so there was a pattern that we got here uh, that depended on the sink squared of this kind of parentheses factor, where I recall that the sink is just sine divided by whatever the uh, argument is inside the sine. So I just wrote it here, it is y to be some generic variable. So you can think of it as sine divided by uh, the uh, argument inside the sign. And for a single wave, no matter where you are on the sensor, the average would always be zero if it was just a single point. Because for every, every given point, you would always have a crest that would be balanced by a trough, and then eventually be balanced by something um, that is neither nor. And it would essentially average out to zero. But this becomes more interesting when you have a slit that has some finite width A, because you can think of the slit as being a set of infinitesimally many little individual points. For each one of these little individual points is emitting its own set of crests and troughs. And sometimes they constructively interfere, and sometimes they destructively interfere. And all of those little individual points, you can think of each individually creating ripples that cascade outward, and each of them eventually hit the sensor and is measured at some location on the sensor. And given that there, the sensor has some finite uh, width A, the idea is that the path length that has traveled from one particular point is not necessarily the same as the path length that has traveled by another one of these individual points coming from the slit of width A. And so these path lengths are different. And so it's not necessarily true that you will always have constructive or deconstructive interference from each of these individual points which is why as a function of time, if I were to look at this sensor as a function of time, no matter where I am on the sensor, I would always see a lot of fluctuations up and down as you have, sometimes you have constructive interference from say this point and this point. Sometimes you have deconstructive interference from the same points since the waves are traveling at different path lengths. Sometimes they interfere constructively, sometimes destructively. So again, by looking at the average as a function of time, you actually can see that there's, on average, a net amount of radiation or intensity, in this case, uh, that arrives at a given point. And so that arrives at this the function here, um, which is what is kind of visually being represented by this function. It peaks along the line that is symmetric along where the single slit is. This is where the most radiation is going to uh, arrive at. This is essentially where it is symmetric above and below the slit, and so you always either have constructive or deconstructive, so everything kind of works together to get you the most intensive radiation at this point. And then there are also these points where no matter what you do, um, you always get, uh, on average, perfectly destructive interference, and they cancel out, and so you always have these kind of uh, dark spots, which is what is being represented. Um, by these dark regions in the image. Where on this image, the saturation of the sensor or the pixels in the sensor, uh, so the thickness is kind of giving you a sense of the total intensity. So there's lots of intensity where I boxed, less intensity here, nothing here, then it increases up to some, some other value here, decreases back down to zero, et cetera. Now, if you understand that, you are most of the way there. So destructive interference, the idea is that you're essentially doing the idea of a single slit, but now you have multiple single slits. So for a double slit experiment, where we have two slits, each of these can be thought as a single slit, where the result that comes from, say, just this slit 
or just this slit is the same thing as what we got up here. But now you're getting both the this single result coming up from the top slit, and you're also getting the same result as what is coming from the bottom slit. And they are emitting a cascade of different kinds of waves, you know, that kind of have this pattern ultimately. But since they are not coming from the exact same slit on the left side of this wall, what arrives at the sensor? Sometimes, again, it's again a question of sometimes the single the slits are constructively interfering with one another, sometimes they are destructively interfering with one another. And so rather than getting kind of a bland pattern like this, where you go from uh, high to zero, high again to zero to high again, and kind of decreases as you go outward, you get something that looks like this here at the top, where again, kind of globally, you go from high to low, to high to low, to high to low. But on top of that, you can see all these extra little features. So instead of going, you know, something like this, you're kind of doing something that kind of oscillates up and down. You know, so you have the general features, but within it, I really should be doing this with not a laser pointer. Um, so you might go from high to low, high to low, high to low. And those amplitudes get smaller as you go out. That's the single slit. For the double slit, you're kind of doing extra bumps and wiggles on top of that feature. So again, this is what, and again, you can kind of see that here, they have all these like intermediate little bright spots that look like little, you know, beads on a string, which are little features on top of these larger regions of brightness and darkness. And so all that does is that takes the original formula you have for the single slit and multiplies it by this additional cosine term, which just incorporates the fact that you have two slits and sometimes those two slits are interfering constructively and deconstructively. So again, what I'm kind of showing here is that you have the single slit, which is the thick dash green line, uh, which would be the case if I were to take one of these slits away and move it back towards the center. But the fact that I have two slits and they're separated some small distance D apart, on top of that dash green line, instead what I actually see is not the dash green line, but I see the black solid lines where the same kind of big shape is, is seen where, you know, you have big, smaller, smaller. But on top of that are additional little wiggles. Now with that pattern, we can actually understand, given an image, we can understand how we can, from an image, back out uh, some of this data. So let's go back to the single slit. So I think this was question two of your lab. So the first question is just which of the images are a single slit, which is a double slit. Hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory at this point. Now let's look at the single slit. There was some confusion on, you know, so I believe Professor Ray, he had something where he had some ruler laid on top of this and he had some markings in centimeters. And I think some people were looking at, say, like peak to valley or peak to peak, and they were calling that either the spatial separation A or the slit separation D. And let's be careful because that's not technically correct. Again, if I go back to the previous page, I'll just kind of compare um, this image here to what's going on here. Where the intensity is highest here, we call x equals zero. So right here, 
is what I would say is x equals zero. And then the intensity goes down to zero as I go away from the center point. So if I call point, this point, say, x1, where it goes to zero here is x1. So the distance from the center of the image to wherever the next dark spot is, is a value for x, which would be you know, one of those guys in, in the equations. Not a and not d. What you can measure using the ruler is x. What you want to use that information to do is to back out things like a and for a single slit or d and a for a double slit. All right, so let's look at that. So again, using the ruler, you're getting measures of x. You are told the wavelength of the light lambda. You are told how far away the sensor is, L. So we need to understand how to use that kind of messy trigonometric equation to get stuff like A and D. And the single slit, the big equation, um, or the big conceptual tool is to realize that for the trig function sync, that function is equal to zero whenever the numerator sine is equal to zero. You know, as you get larger and larger and larger values, uh, the numerator is going to oscillate between plus one and minus one, but the denominator is going to just keep getting bigger. So whenever this entire thing equals zero, that only is going to happen when the numerator is zero. And you know from trig that sine of y is equal to zero whenever y is some multiple of pi, where m is either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, da, 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 da. And technically, m equals 0 is also a solution, but go back to Professor Ray's lecture and remember that sine of 0 divided by 0 is actually 1. So that is the kind of exception to this particular case. So once, as long as you are not exa exactly along the center of the sensor, and you're looking instead at, say, this spot, or this spot, or this spot, or this spot, or this spot. You can ask yourself, when, when are, do those dark spots occur? They occur when whatever is inside the sine function, which I'm calling here y, is some multiple of pi. And going back to the previous uh, slide, previous equation, the idea was for a single slit that occurred when this kind of expression pi a over lambda times x over l is some multiple of pi, where m is either 1, 2, 3, etc. So again, what you could do is you could measure with that ruler the distance from the center to the first trough, or the first dark point, or from the center to the second dark point. This first location is the first dark spot, so that corresponds to m equals 1. This spot is the second dark spot. That corresponds to m equals 2. And of course, it's symmetric, so you would get the same answer, m equals 1, m equals 2 on the left-hand side. And for either of those measures, you know, m equals 1 will have a, a certain x value. m equals 2 will have a different x value. But you should find no matter which one you use, whether it's one or two, and whatever the corresponding x value is for it. Uh, you know pi, you then know m and x, l is given to, lambda is given to, pi, you can look up, you can solve for a, for the single slit. For the double slit example, so the double slit example is not exactly the same as the single slit example. There is a different value of a, and now that since it's a double slit, there's also a value of d you have to figure out. So I leave it to you to do the same procedure again to find the value of a. But then to find the value of d, you have to then start looking at all these individual light and dark spots. If this is kind of the center, The idea here is now you have, if you recall from the previous equation, uh, the double slit introduces this additional term here, which is a cosine term. And cosine is maximized 
whenever whatever is inside the cosine is a multiple of pi. For a sine, that's when it equals zero. For a cosine, that's when it's maximized. So by looking at the individual locations, you know, if this is zero, x equals zero, there's some location distance x to get to the first kind of bright inner bright spot. Another x to go to here, another x to go to the third bright spot, etc. And so the distances that correspond to you know, one, two, three, or whenever what is, whatever is inside the cosine is equal to some number, which could be zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera, times pi. And so again, looking inside what the cosine function has, that corresponds to this right here. So again, looking at each of these intermediate little bright spots that you notice uh, within the larger pattern and counting them, you know, counting this the first bright spot, the second bright spot, the third bright spot. So this would correspond to L equals one, L equals two, L equals three. You could measure with a ruler that distance to get to those spots for some L equals one, two, or three. And again, you know pi, you know L, you know X, L, uh, lambda, pi, you can then solve for d. So again, the distance from kind of the middle to the dark patches is useful to get a. The distance between the center and the individual little bright bumps within the pattern allow you to get d. And so that is question then three. So you essentially do that again for the second image that is for the double slit experiment. But just, I don't know if Professor Ray did this, but just to kind of show you what this looks like in practice, you know, for me, I always like to make little easy simulations that I can look at to help me visualize what's going on. So this is the intensity pattern for a single slit should look familiar, it kind of peaks right here in the center at x, x equals zero, the very center of the sensor. And as you get farther away to the left or the right of the sensor, the amplitude of the intensity dr dramatically drops. And for these sorts of things, so what this is plotting, um, what, is, what is being plotted here on this graph is exactly this equation. Uh, it's essentially plotting sink squared blah times cosine squared blah. Um, and there are two parameters as a function of x, which is left to right. Then there are two parameters that I'm allowed to tweak a and d, uh, which is the size of the slit and how and the distance between two slits, if there are two slits. So right now, d is set equal to 0. So this is just a single slit. And these are the sorts of things I like to do. Uh, I like decode up little things so I can see how if I change particular parameters, I can see how the answer changes. All right, so the first thing I might ask is, I have light coming through a single slit. And now all I'm gonna do is make the slit bigger and bigger and bigger and just see how the answer changes. So it's gonna always remain a single slit. I'm just gonna make the slit bigger and bigger and bigger. So again, just increasing the size of the slit. All that happens is the intensity seems to become more sharply concentrated exactly at the point of symmetry, x equals 0. And you can ask, why is that? Well, again, looking back at the single slit uh, kind of example of what a single slit represents, Remember, we can think of a single slit as being a place where you can have a bunch of tiny little individual points, each uh, emitting radiation um, out towards the sensor. And the larger you make the slit, the more of these can fit within the slit and emit you know, crests and troughs. So the more that there are, the more common it is that no matter where you are on the sensor, wherever there's a peak, there's also a trough arriving from some other point somewhere else on the slit. So you always more or less cancel yourself out except along that point of symmetry. 
directly along the center. You know, to use an example uh, for, from images, if that makes sense, then stop listening um, if you don't want to be confused uh, or potentially confused. But a thing I like to think of with the single slit, you know, if you had an image like, say, my face, um, and you were looking at my face through a very tiny slit that was much, much smaller than my face, you would actually see a diffraction pattern where my face would kind of be uh, kind of copied in multiple locations, no matter where your sensor was, um, where you would essentially see my face along the center, but there might be, you know, reflections or, or other smaller images, you know, elsewhere. Versus if I increase the size of the slit so that, you know, you think of an extreme example, where now the slit is a giant garage door and I, my face is just the size of my face. Obviously the garage door is much, much bigger than my face. So you would essentially just see an image of my face along a straight line connecting your eyeball to my face. You would just see me where I'm actually located. You would not see any sort of weird uh, diffraction pattern uh, where my face would appear elsewhere. Anyway. Now for the double slit, we can see how the double slit is going to change the answer. So I'm going to keep A fixed. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to increase D from zero. So I'm going to introduce a double slit and I'm going to move the two slits farther and farther away from each other. So as you do that, you see the pattern starts to kind of start to ripple back and forth. The dashed line is again, just what it would be for a single slit. So as I allow there for to be double slits, the actual intensity diffraction pattern you see kind of always stays inside the single slit, but there are all these additional bumps and wiggles that are introduced. And some things to notice is that notice, for example, there's always the most intensity here in the center. You know, that's kind of the point of symmetry. And then when you have multiple slits, like two slits here, where you see peaks changes. And it's not actually always the same as where there would be a peak if there's a single slit. Like look at this one, for example, there's a peak right here, let's say like four and a half. But as I increase the distance between the slits, sometimes where the peaks occur is not exactly at four and a half, but it occurs at places that are kind of nearby, but not quite. Um, at the place where it would be for a single slit. Uh, but that's okay, because remember when we were using those expressions before, for the single slits, or to find the value of a, little a in this case, we were only looking at where the places are where the intensity was equal to zero. And those places, notice, aren't changing as I change the distance between the slits. So no, no matter what the distance is between the slits, the spots where uh, the intensity equals zero is always the same. So it's always okay to use this expression to find the value of A, where you're finding, you're measuring X as the locations where it, they are dark spots or where there is zero radiation. For a double slit, the locations of the maximum, like here, it's you know, here in the center, here a little off here, Here's here, 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 etc. Depends on both A and D, um, which allow, which is why you have to use this to find A, uh, which gives you the location, you know, the size of the slits, and then the maximums that result on top of that. Uh, for example, you know, this would be L equals zero. This is L equals one. This is L equals two you know, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, allow you to then get D, which I believe should um, allow you to complete the lab. So hopefully that was helpful if you had questions, hopefully that um, illuminates a little bit on kind of what you're supposed to do with this lab uh, and reach out if you have more questions.